Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk Sport. Today, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Connor Porter. City beat Porto at home 3-1. Now, it looked convincing from City. It seemed convincing. They went down to a Diaz goal. But is this just the start of a good campaign for City, or is this yet another easy group, if I dare say? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, we saw how City played uh, at the weekend against Arsenal. And that was very much a telling game, really. That was like a, I don't want to say a must-win game, um, but it felt like it was because City had had a, such a, a poor start to the season in retrospect to the likes of Liverpool, um, who are their main rivals and have been their main rivals for the past couple of years. So when you saw Liverpool performing as well as they were in the Premier League over the past couple of seasons and City has fallen away, really, in, a, in the past uh, half a season or so, uh, since Liverpool started running away with the Premier League title, they needed to respond. And it started really against Arsenal. It carried on through into this game as well. And I, 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 I don't want to say that Porto is a, is, a, is, a, is a bad side, but they're not as good as City, shall we say. Um, and it showed in this game in terms of quality and uh, in terms of how well the, the two teams performed. Sergio Aguero, uh, Raheem Sterling uh, doing great. Uh, Gundogan uh, with the free kick too uh, mm -hmm. Ferran Torres um, with the third one on the night as well it was, it, it was a great indication really as to the, the quality and depth that City can show and the quality and depth that had gone missing really for the past half a season or so um, so this was, this was a great result for them Porto of course had um, the departure of uh, Tellys over the summer um, how much that plays into it, not too sure. Probably too early to to to, to really give a judgment on that. But I think I think this will be the game that that Porto will, will will pretty much say, yeah, if we can come away from this game with a draw, then it's a great result. I don't think they had a a. I don't want to say that you know they would be happy with the loss, but it's just it's just one of those games really where you know if it lasts okay, it's a loss against Manchester City, um, one of the best sides in Europe. You know at you can't City as well you, at City as well. You can't sulk over it too much. Um, you just have to push it under the rug and and focus on the next game in the competition. You know when Porto goes up against Olympiacos and Marseille, those are the kind of games that. I would expect Porto to be competitive in and be they should, they should be, be looking that, to win. Yeah. Be looking Those to win. Games. Yeah. So I wouldn't be too disheartened for for Porto, uh, but at the same time, you have to give credit to to City because they 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 showed the uh, the quality and depth that they had in this game um, with, with performances like you know they weren't reliant on on Kevin De Bruyne because he he's he's injured he's, he he wasn't able to play um, and. It, it just it just reevaluated for me the strength and depth that City have got um, with the performance of, of Gundogan and uh, of Ferran Torres coming off the bench to score too. So it was a, a great overall performance by the City squad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a fair point. We just said it off the bench. I mean, if you've got someone like if you've got Torres, Foden, and Fernandinho who can come off the bench, I, I think your squad depth is pretty much sorted out. I thought it was positive as well for for Ruben Diaz as well, which is. A, I mean, he's. I think he started very, very well. He started okay his Manchester City career. So, I mean, there are lots of positives that Pep can take from this. It was, a, it was basically, I don't want to say an, an easy win, but it was a routine win. And I think that's all that really mattered during this fixture congestion. Well, I think after 15 minutes, they weren't thinking it was, an, it was going to be no, an easy win. <laughs> I, I joked with you, Lars, saying that they probably signed the wrong Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I like the run that he did there, which was similar to that of Werner that he did against Southampton. Wondering if as soon as you get someone who runs at this defence, City are going to struggle like a Werner. But <laughs> that, that will, that's to be seen in the future. And, and yeah. also good that Aguero, after his long injury, has, also, has got a goal there against Porto. I thought it was, it was positive. positive. Yeah, definitely positive. Um, only, only a goal from the spot, but, you know, pressurised situation. You've got, you got to convert them. Yeah, yeah it still counts. Um, but, but like I said, just the, uh, the fact that um, Gundogan stepped up in this game and uh, Ferran Torres came off the bench, it, it gives me a lot of confidence that uh, City can, can be looking to progress further in the competition. 
once it gets into the last stages because I think I think we're both in confidence really that City should progress out of the group stages unless there's a Absolutely. major injury in the squad or, or a slip up or anything like that. Even and, so, uh, after after seeing Olympiakos Marseille, mm. if you're getting surpassed by one of those two teams, I think you've got to question Guardiola as a manager. Right, and then once once Kevin De Bruyne returns to the squad, it only gets exactly. stronger too. So it it should it gives me a lot of confidence seeing that City's. Um, City's depth players can come into this team and and uh, help them pick up a result. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And so moving on, we got Chelsea who drew nil nil with Sevilla at home. Now, same as the Manchester United one, is this a good result or a bad result? Because I mean, this is Frank Lampard's first nil nil result as a Chelsea manager, which proves maybe he can defend. But then <laughs> there was no firepower up front, so I don't know if it, I saw one Chelsea fan on Twitter saying. Well, usually when we can't defend, we we can attack. But when we can defend, we can't attack. It's it's, it's very frustrating. Do you make anything of a nil nil draw to Sevilla? Because I think Sevilla could be a dark horse in this competition. They could, and so therefore I do make something of it because for the past few seasons we've known about Chelsea's struggles when it comes to defending. Uh, the big one being Kepper and uh, Mendy coming in being the, the main signing, the big major signing for them in the summer between the sticks, demonstrated in this game as to why he should be the number one for Chelsea. Um, fantastic saves throughout this game by him. And Frank Lampard said after the game as well that uh, we knew his qualities when he came in and he showed them today he's our number one for now. So it pretty much solidifies that Mende has won this number one gig in uh, in just a space of a month against Kepa. And it demonstrates as well as to why they spent the money that he did uh, signing him from uh, from Reigns, who of course are in the same group as them. So that's going to be a a, a, a funny funny game when they take place uh, in. A, I think it's at the end of November that game takes place. Mm. So that's going to be that's going to be an interesting one. Probably not going to be too much hassle for Mendy because of course there's there's not going to be any fans. Um, but I. I, I I still put a lot of credit down to to Mendy for this uh, nil nil performance because just how solid that he was in between the sticks, it just demonstrated us to why it was so important for Chelsea to sign him in the summer and why he should be the number one for the Blues moving forward in between the sticks. Yeah, I think I, I think it's absolutely right what you're saying. Mendy is. I thought Mendy was was good in this match. He didn't have. I mean, he had some things to do, but he seemed reassured. That's one thing that your goalkeeper needs to be. He needs to be confident in what he's doing. When Kepa comes out for crosses, he's half hesitant, and you just don't... It can't breed confidence into your defence when you've got that. So, Mendy, I, I questioned it. I thought, the buying his goalkeeper from Renford, and he's 28, so he's older than Kepa. I'm wondering if this is a short-term fix or if this is genuinely their goalkeeper for the next five years. That I think I think it's we, definitely yeah. You got to remember with goalkeepers the 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 time in the game, the lifespan in the game is is longer than the outfield player. And absolutely yes. Yeah. But then so, he he is still older than Kepper. So what well, does that, Will, where does Willie, that leave Kepper? Willie Caballero is older than Petr Cech. So yes, as well. But <laughs> Willie Caballero I, I, always came, always came in as a backup. That yeah. was there was never going to be any other doubt. Caballero came in as backup. But Mendy it's, just, now, it's, it's to say it's to say player. it's to say though. Um, if if you're a goalkeeper, as long as you manage your body correctly, as long as you're any player and you manage your body correctly, then you'll be able to 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 span your career for a very long time. 28 years old, he can play until he's 38. Whether or not they'll be at the top of his game, don't know. But I think it's a longer lifespan than five years at the football club. Whether oh, or not that's absolutely. going to be 10 years, then we'll have to. That's, that's, I think that's projecting a bit too far into the future because we don't know what Chelsea is going to look like in 10 years. But um, overall, I think for Overall, I think he's he's probably the best. Um, I, I don't want to say the best buy that Chelsea's had over the summer because that's a lot when you you see how well Kyle Havertz has played for him um, and Timo Werner's starting to get going a bit, get a bit and uh, Chilwell played fantastic in this game too. So it's <laughs> you got a lot of transfers to compete against there, but I suppose it's you know if you want to say it like a one a one b one c one d situation as to these transfers because they've just been they've just been great signings there's just unfortunate really that they're not all firing at the same time unfortunately all cylinders aren't firing at the same time i think 
once all the cylinders are firing at the same time for Chelsea, we're going to see a real powerhouse starting to move forward. Um, whether or not that's good enough to compete on two fronts in the Premier League and the Champions League, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but really, it's about, it's about, as you said, getting those pistons firing in attack and in defence at the same time in order to pick up results and to make sure uh, that they're scoring enough goals for the results and keeping the clean sheets as well, or reducing the amount of goals that they concede in order to get games over the line and making sure that wins stay wins and they don't turn into draws or losses uh, near their end of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's one thing about Mendy. He's not a spectacular goalkeeper. I don't think a lot of people rated him because when you see his matches in league, oh, he's not he's not the one who will give you those David De Gea-style saves that look phenomenal for the cameras. But he is a reassured, very calm goalkeeper and tall, covers his goal very well. I, I, with Chelsea, it's always the problems with errors, just errors simply. Kurt Zuma made a couple as well this match, which it just frustrates you. Because, But then Mendy got him out of jail on one of those, so that's fine. But if Chelsea can't eradicate these errors, then they're not going to go anywhere. I think they will, though. And I still have them as my favourite for winning the title. That was a big shout I put at the beginning of the season. And I still think once everyone's firing, especially Kai Havertz and Timo Werner, they will be one of the most dangerous teams in the league. Yeah, and certainly, um, you know, Chilwell and Reese James, I think, deserve a lot of credit too. The way that Chelsea played, really, um, throughout throughout the season so far, you see a lot of Mount and Pulisic and whoever's on those wings drift inside, which allows the likes of uh, the wing backs to push forward a little bit more. And we've seen that with Reese James and Chilwell. Um, Chilwell at his time at Leicester and Reese James for Chelsea last season. He's really progressed and really come into his own at the, at that in that team and. I, th- I think he's definitely locked down that position moving forward. Um, and Chilwell's definitely in there as well. Just like you said, you know, a little bit of problems at the centre-back position. Sometimes they're still making mistakes. And of course, Thiago Silva is uh, is is a veteran player now. So he uh, he can't be played every single game. Um, otherwise, he'll just run out of legs and you won't be able to get the best performances out of him. So questions still remain about their centre-back partnership. I think it's not set in stone yet, but... A lot of those places in that team now are locked in pretty much every single game. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Wondered if you had any other matches that you thought stood out this week on the champ- in the Champions League, Connor. Well, I think we can't really finish off this video without talking about that Real Madrid game. I think that's absolutely, a big one yeah. to talk about, of course. Real Madrid Dominic. to uh, Shakhtar Donetsk, free, surprisingly, at the Bernabeu. Um, to me, this just spells as to what's been going on at Real Madrid all summer. The fact mm-hmm. that they didn't sign a single player to boost their squad, yet the Champions League performances that they had last season were not good enough. And of course, it, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a situation that is out of Real Madrid's hands unfortunately, because of the, the, the COVID pandemic and things like that. It's a little bit uncontrollable in a way. Um, but they still have quality in their squad. Vinicius Jr. looks fantastic. Luka Modric, of course. Um, Rafael Werner. Uh, Varney, sorry. Um, I, can't, I can never pronounce his name. Varane. Uh, Varane. Varane, there we go. Um, he's... He'll be disappointed He's with that a lot of goal. stick, hasn't he, for his yeah. two reasons. I mean, he was terrible yesterday and, and was also terrible in his last match, which is against City. Mm. He'll, be but, disappointed. Then, uh, He'll be disappointed with that own goal. But at the same time, we have to give credit to uh, Shakhtar for their fantastic performance. Seven absolutely. starters in that team under the age of 21. Um, yeah, their average age was about 24, if I remember, or 23, sorry, 23.5, which was a lot younger than Real Madrid's. And Real Madrid had young players on the pitch as well. But I, I, uh, I don't want to jinx it just yet, but maybe I could pull this question over to you. Do you think there's a chance that Shakhtar Donetsk could potentially be an Ajax from two years ago? Ooh, it it wouldn't be the worst of shouts, and but they're in a t- they're in a really tough. They're group. in a That's really the tough group. That's why I but don't want to be uh, too questionable about it. I see. I see. Like the almost Costa Rica 2014 World Cup, you know, where <laughs> they just beat those teams, but then just quietly get qualify qualify through. I can see that happening because the way they played was great and. This wasn't three goals that he just scored out of nothing. Courtois got them out quite a few times with one-on-one saves. So there needs to be credit where it's due. They knew what Real Madrid's weakness were, weaknesses were, which was weirdly enough the two centre-backs. I think they're both good centre-backs in their own right. 
but they, they so badly don't complement each other. They're both mm. two who want to go towards the ball and Mendy and Marcelo just stayed way too deep. And you could have someone like Dentino who's not fast, but making him look slow. So I think Zidane also got a few things wrong, especially the fact he started Luka Jovic, which I'm starting to question the whole transfer now of Luka Jovic, if it was worth it or if he should just, they should just cut their losses on that one. It's because a, Benzema, a... when he came on, changed the match and we knew he would. But he's also got the Clasico this weekend, so there's, mm. there are other factors. I also, I mean, it was weird enough, but Shakhtar knew that every Real Madrid player depends on their favorite foot. If you look at Modric's goal, they purposely push him out to the, so that he can't, push, he can't shoot on his right foot. He does eventually, but they make sure that they can't use their favorite feet and then they just get lost in the game. Asensio was a typical example as well. Uh, Shakhtar did their homework and they absolutely want the match. Shakhtar were, were brilliant. They were absolutely phenomenal. And uh, thankfully we've got VAR to rule out that last goal because uh, if not, that would have been a... That would have been a bit of a sad one for Shakhtar to take. I can see Shakhtar, if they play like this, going far. Yeah, Tete. But they have to continue playing like that. Yeah, Tete looked great. Uh, goal assist on the night. Um, we have to give credit to just how, how brilliantly they started off this game. Um, you know, as you said, just applying the pressure, finding the weaknesses in this team and, and exploiting them as a result. And once they got off to that, once they got to the 3-0 lead, essentially then they didn't really want half time to come, but unfortunately it did. And that gave Real Madrid a, a chance to reset. And sure enough, they did with Luka Modric coming out just under 10 minutes into the second half and uh, and getting the, the goals coming in for, for Real Madrid. And Vinicius Jr. was not too far behind. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that Shakhtar Donetsk defence held on for its dear mites and they picked up a result. So this was an overall fantastic team performance by Shakhtar to get the result on the night at the Bernabeu. Granted, for the third time in this video, it wasn't in front of fans. But I think right now we see just how big of an impact fans can play in games like this, especially on Champions League nights of all nights as well. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if this, if this happens in, 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 other, in other teams um, moving forward when they play against their... Uh, the unlikeliest opponents at home and things like that, whether or not that is a, a continuation on um, from what we've seen uh, in behind closed doors matches uh, so far since football restarted. Um, you know, we, 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 we think that, you know, teams when they play at home is the big home advantage factor, but games like this uh, where Shakhtar Donetsk come out and win three goals to two at Real Madrid are a clear example as to why the home home field advantage factor simply doesn't exist in the COVID era. And it's going to make Champions League football at the, at the, at the very least in the group stages, a bit more exciting to watch because sometimes it can be a bit dull when you see, you know, in, for example, another game that happened this past week, Barcelona uh, against uh, the hung- Hungarian team, uh, Ferenc Baros, I want to say, um, Vakos, uh, I, I'm butchering the pronunciation again, but just that game, even if fans were in that stadium, if they weren't, Barcelona's thrashing them and winning that game, unfortunately, because of the quality and differences in squads. But it still gives you a little bit of hope because the fans do play that extra factor in games. Um, it gives you a little bit of hope that the underdog can come out and win those games. And we saw it in the restart tournament when it was played in Portugal. The fact that uh, Bayern Munich were able to pick up such a a dominant performance against Barcelona, how PSG made it all the way to the final, how Marseille as well progressed far in the competition. Leon, Leon. Uh, Leon, sorry. Um, It was was a clear demonstration that these these games where, where fans aren't present, they could be really exciting in the Champions League and it gives you an extra reason to to watch those games happen and unfold because you could end up watching a game like Real Madrid versus Shakhtar where the Shakhtar come out by three goals to two winners. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, I looked at how many home wins there were during the Champions League and how many away wins, and it was exactly the same. There were six home wins, six away wins during the Champions League, so that, that proves that this whole uh, the fans being absent clearly plays a role. I mean, there's no doubt. I think Rafael Varane doesn't make the same mistakes if he's got... Uh, 70,000 Real Madrid supporters behind him shouting but it it will make for an interesting one and the way things are going who knows we might have to do a one match knockout for the the knockout stages of the Champions League as well so 
that can give a team like Atalanta, a team like Shakhtar, maybe a strong chance of getting through. I think so. so yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I, I also want to point out that I don't know if you saw my wild prediction the other day, but I went out and said that Barcelona would win this competition. Or I saw them winning it just because of also the randomness that we can bring to not having fans. They won 5 1. Last time they won 5 1, their first game. Do you know what, do you know what year that was and what happened? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it's probably going to be a win, uh, a, a, a season where they won the Champions League. So prob- probably in the early 2010s, some, some point around there, probably. Exactly. Exactly <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. It was under Pep Guardiola. The first match they won 5 1. That against Panathaikos, not against this team. But still, I mean, just to help my argument if I can. <laughs> Plus, also, another good fact is that a team from Group G has never won the Champions League, so maybe Juventus and Barcelona can say bye-bye to their chances. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to, to, to watch that game, of course, coming up next to the Champions League, Juventus versus Barcelona, Ronaldo versus Messi, potentially one of the final times we see that match up happen. Mm-hmm. Maybe, we'll have to wait and see, but it's, it's going to be an exciting one to watch that. Um, and, and see how that match particularly unfolds because I think that'll be like a real two, uh, that'll be one of the first true big clashes in this season in Champions League uh, besides the uh, the Paris Saint Germain and United game. Um, so it'll be it'll be interesting to watch and see how that unfolds. Absolutely, yeah. I just also want to point out Angelino who scored two goals. Wonder what City are thinking now, considering that they have to have a right back at left back. But Angelino, who's started well this season and also on loan at RB Leipzig, option to buy at the end if he makes 12 appearances. He's already got six. I'm sure he'll make the 12. And City will probably, well, they'll be shooting themselves in the foot if they let him go. But that's the, the deal is done. That's, that's how football works sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But he was good last year at Leipzig, so I don't know what they didn't yeah. see in him. But anyway, and I also, also was a big fan of him. Um, mm. I don't know if you know about Shoz Buzley very young player from Hungary scoring a goal for Salzburg and it's it's definitely one to check out that's one of my highlights I mean there were, yeah. there were a couple of good goals you think of Modric couldn't have won but that one's coming off the bar it was a nice one to see if anyone wants to check that one out and in, in that group as well of course I mentioned about big games that have happened already and big games to come of course we had Bayern versus uh, Atletico and uh, absolutely and uh, Bayern just picked up where they uh, picked up where they left off in this competition oh, yeah and I find it interesting that Muller wasn't great, but Lewandowski was really poor in this game. He was just a completely a shadow that night. And Koeman was the, was the man of the night. He was two, an assist and two goals. And also Talisa getting a goal. So me watching French commentary, you can imagine the scenes that there were. They were going absolutely <laughs> mad saying Talisa should... No, no, not really. But it was, it, was, it was a good spectacle to see and, and good to see Koeman stepping up to it, especially with the pressure of Gnabry now. I mean, so I was happy to see that. It was a good win for Bayern Munich. Picked up where they left off by defeating or annihilating a Luis Suarez team. Yeah, the signing of Sané as well during the summer means basically the, oh, sorry, yeah, Sané, um, yeah. I meant. The, uh, the, the places in the team are, are not set in stone. Um, even if you perform, uh, well, then they're, they're set in stone as long as you keep on performing. And if you don't, there's already a replacement lined up waiting, raring to go. Uh, Gnabry, Komen, uh, Sané all can play in those kind of positions. Um, Even Davis, who's not getting a start now because of, of uh, Teo Hernandez. Mm. Lucas Hernandez, sorry. Not Teo. Yeah, there's, there's, there's so many players at Bayern Munich that you could expect this team once more to, to go far in the competition. And the way that they performed against Atletico is just a, a prime example of that happening uh, this season once more. So it's 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 going to be it's going to be another great season, I think, for Bayern Munich in the Champions League. So long as they can uh, stay fresh and stay away from those injuries. Yeah, that's the main thing. Mm. I also thought I'd watch a uh, Red Bull Salzburg and Lokomotiv Lokomotiv Moscow because I mean, who doesn't like Salzburg after what Haaland did? And I was hoping for Dakar to really light it up. Like he's got as many goals, not as many goals, but he's got a great goal scoring record similar to what Haaland had at the beginning of his career. And he just unfortunately disappointed against probably the, the weakest opposition that there was in the Champions League. So I, I was a bit disappointed in that, but I'm sure he'll kick on a bit. But yeah, yeah I think it's going to be difficult, I think, for those two to, to battle against uh, Atletico Madrid and Bayern in that group. But Absolutely, I, yeah. we'll have to wait and see really as to what they can do. 
Yeah, they, they looked weak and I don't expect them to get results against them. But anything can happen in this Champions League, as we've already seen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, thanks for joining me then, Connor. Thank you, Seb. And thanks for uh, talking about this week in the Champions League. It should be a, an exciting one next week. We've got some, some great fixtures coming. coming up. Yeah, we've got some great fixtures coming up. We've well, got... Leipzig go to Manchester United with a... Haven't, mm. lost, away, haven't lost away from home since, the, since Frankfurt in February. So that should be an interesting one. Got uh, Much and Gladbach as well going up against Real Madrid. Uh, I'm sure Jamie, our good friend Jamie, will have his eye on that one, especially oh, after Shakhtar picked up the result against Real Madrid. So that'll be a great one. But I expect Real Madrid to win. Their away record in the Champions League is more is better than their home record. Their home yeah. record notoriously failed them a bit last year. Has started badly this year as well. And and of course we've got the uh, the showdown between uh, Messi and Ronaldo, Juventus, Barcelona. Barcelona, that's probably going to be the most watched Champions League game Absolutely. of the yeah. week as well. So Without that's going to be doubt. exciting. I'll have my eye on it no matter what. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for everyone who's listening. Don't forget to subscribe with that button wherever it is. <laughs> and we'll join you next time for another video on Let's Talk Sport. <laughs>